So welcome everyone, Lele here, and this is another of the IORG cast. So IORG cast is the opportunity for IORG and uh, to share, you know, what is anything about the information overload as well, but not only, right? Also knowledge about tools, knowledge about communication, because information overload is something that happens if you're not so well aware about communication and also about the history of communication, right? So, and that's what we are talking about today is a bit of history perhaps. And uh, with us, there is actually the I, I, marvelous historian for of technology and computing. I don't know how to define you, but I, I always get um, excited about all the things that you have to share, Nathan. So with me, please guys, I'm happy to welcome Nathan Zeldes our uh, you know, president and uh, uh, you know, who actually has at home a kind of IT museum to share mm. with us. Ciao, Nathan. How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Pleasure to be talking to you, as always. So, uh, t tell, tell us a bit, you know, before going into your museum, right? So anything, uh, because we had also IR cast with you, we were talking about, you know, information overload and so on, but uh, you, we didn't actually share your whole experience to a you know, bigger extension. So tell us something more about you as, you know, background and you know, skills and expertise. So I'm a physicist uh, by training, I would say. I studied applied physics and I worked in high tech for what, almost 30 years now, uh, most of them at Intel. So I was an, an engineer mm -hmm. and a manager and a principal engineer at Intel. And over the years, I gravitated from actually working in a manufacturing environment, working in IT, where I was in charge of improving the way in their employees interact with computers. And that is how I got to the subject of information overload. And uh, when I started fixing that problem, that's where the information overload research group or IOG mm -hmm. got founded. When I cooperated with people like me in other companies, and we got together to work on the problem globally. And, and, but, but so a, a physical engineer, so what is your, um, your, your passion? Because it's actually a, a big field, right? Any, any particular thing you like? There. What in physics? Yeah. Well, as a physicist, I studied the electro optics and solid state uh, devices. Okay. The solid okay. state devices are probably what got me into Intel. And uh, the electro optics taught me a lot of stuff. And actually, much of the stuff goes back to when I was a, a ham radio operator and electronics hobbies. That's how it all started. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. could say that I uh, much prefer building things than than the theory of the physics. So, and I think you, you have also built several devices, right? Or what's, what's the most challenging thing you built? Good question. I think probably I built an oscilloscope, a lab oscilloscope totally from scratch for, to my own design. When I was younger, I think that was the most uh, difficult thing to do at home. But anything you can do at home that is as good as a commercial product, I love doing those. Mm -hmm. And I hope you were gonna show us some of this, right? Uh, but tell us more about also your passion for you know, collecting in the computing artifacts and the history of it. So where did it start? Uh, well, originally, what I had is I had the junk box, what we uh, radio amateurs call a junk box which are many boxes full of, of surplus military equipment and all sorts of junk and every radio that got thrown out in the family and so on, mm -hmm. and bits and pieces of them. And over time, I started to, to take an interest in the development over time. So equipment from you know before World War II, during the war, after the war, and on to my own life. And as time moves forward, you get smaller and smaller devices and new technologies. So I began to, to put more attention into collecting sequences of things over time. And then something marvelous happened, I can show you here. I was in Italy and I went to, to an antique shop and I found this item here. And I had no idea what it was. I mean, I knew it was a slide rule. I had the slide rule when I was a student. Okay. But I had no idea what this one is. 
So I bought it for, I think, 20 euro. I didn't know what it was worth, and the seller didn't know what it was worth. What is it? When I started examining it, you know, and interacting with people who know more, it turned out to be a slide rule from 1830, uh, and it's probably worth a thousand dollars or something like that. I mean, it's a, it's a magnificent example in superb condition of a French slide rule made by the, the best slide rule maker of the, the era. Mm. Okay. So, by the time I finished investigating that, I had talked to some people that were collectors, serious collectors of these things, and I decided I liked the idea, and I started collecting seriously. And that would be maybe 20 years ago. And since then, I've been collecting history of computing in general, and slide rules, and calculators in particular. And what are the uh, the, the number of, of your, like, do you, do you connect, like, count them and have, uh, uh, you know, you know what pieces you're missing, so how do you work with the collection? Or it just Not really. I mean, I certainly don't know how many slide rules I have. I do know that I don't have very many. I mean, I certainly have, you count them in, in I don't know, less than 100. And they say less because serious collectors, especially in America, the land of possibilities would have thousands. And I don't, because what I do is I focus, uh, first I have to fit things into my apartment, so I'm limited in space. And second, I have, again, I look at interesting historical trends. So if I see a device on eBay, especially, or in, in an antique market that fills a hole in my collection that represents something I don't have, I buy that one device. I never go into buying, you know, a, a device from every manufacturing gear of the same thing, which some people do, because to me they're all the same. I want a different kind of thing representing a different invention or a different idea or a different development in the history. And of course, today with eBay, that is easier than before, but still you have to look for a long time before you some, find something interesting uh, that's worth collecting. So in, in, for interesting, you, you, you mean um, like a piece of like historical value or that is a value for a history of physics in particular, or it's a, a communication history? So what, what is your criteria? Well, of course, I have a, a, some communication stuff around because I was a, a radio amateur, but no, I mostly look at the history of computing and computing technology, both mechanical mm -hmm. and electronic. Okay. So that's what I mean. Was something interesting to me, of course, other collectors are interested in different things. Cool. So can you take us through some of the most interesting part of your museum and uh, what is the... So I, I brought you this collection. For you. I put some shoe boxes on my table here with things that I want to show you, which will follow what I said, the development over time. And I will start with this device. So this is the Gunther scale. It's called after Edmund Gunther, who was in, let me see how you can see. Okay. Right. So it's a wooden ruler with yeah. a lot of scales on it. And most of them have to do with navigation at sea and that kind of stuff, because uh, this was the, you know, the British Empire and the, would need that sort of things. Although this is the 17th century, so it's pretty old. I mean, not this device. This device is 19th century, but the invention is 17th. And the idea is it has a logarithmic scale on it. Okay. And okay. if you remember your high school math, in when you do the logarithm of a product, you add the logarithms of the two numbers. Mm -hmm. So you can move from multiplication and division to addition and subtraction with logarithms. And what you do to add logarithms is you take this, which is a pair of compasses, and you measure up the, the logarithms on the scale and you start adding them to see the sum. And if you do that right, and if you know what you're doing, then you are going to be able to multiply numbers very rapidly compared to the old way, which was mm -hmm. with pencil and tape. So this is the Gunther rule, which was standard So it's like a calculator, basically, for, for advanced. Calculator. And it was very common. I mean, it was in, in much use. It's not that accurate, by the way. I tested it, and, and it has some mistakes. But what can you do? So that is the Gunther rule. <laughs> Next, what do we have? 
Well, we have the books of logarithms, which is the way people did things if they didn't have one of those. Here is a book of logarithms. It's a big table, basically. It has pages and pages, and they all look like this, full of numbers. For any number with six decimal places, you can find the logarithms and, and add them with pencil and paper and go back to the book and find the result. So I show you this so you can appreciate the value of having what I'm going to show you next, which is the slide rule. The slide rule was invented by William Oughtred in the 17th century. And what he did is instead of adding lengths along a ruler with compasses, he took two rulers like this and put them next to each other. So you can add the distances by positioning them, the two rulers right. Mm -hmm. This is a very simple slide rule. And that idea caught on, and over the next few centuries, these assumed many forms. The oldest slide rule I have is this one. So it sits in its leather oh, okay. thingy, and it, it actually has a pretty bad smell because it smells of, of mildew. You now it, it sat somewhere wet over its uh, 300 years or so of history, mm -hmm. right? This is a, from 1770. Like original so, piece. This one, yeah, before the American Revolution. And if you know, the Americans then were obsessed with no taxation without representation. This is for taxation. Mm -hmm. This is a slide rule. You can see that it has four slides. So here's yeah. one slide going in and out. Here is another. On each side, it has this one is a bit stuck, but you can mm -hmm. see it. And this one too will go up. So four of them. Yeah. And each side does something different. But basically what this does, is calculate the tax on alcohol. If you have a barrel full of wine mm -hmm. or half full of wine and you want to know how much volume is in the barrel, which is kind of you know round, uh, you, you use this to calculate how much alcohol is in there and from that you calculate how much tax they should pay. That's the idea. So you did liters basically, right? Well, it shows you the volume and it, it shows you depending on what kind of wine, is it ale or is it wine and how many oh, yeah, okay. gallons and all sorts of things like that. Also it depends on where the, the barrel is standing on end or lying on its side because of its shape is not the same. Okay. You know. so, so that was used in the market to evaluate uh, how much. It, you know what, what it was used yes. by? Because if you go in, you have here on the other side of the slide, the name of the guy who used it. Okay. John Ramsden, officer of the excise. So he's mm -hmm. a tax collector. That was his profession. Mm -hmm. So every day okay. goes for... Yeah. And then we have other form factors. But the big innovation is the one I showed you, actually. This one is was invented by James Watt, the guy who invented the steam engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, until his time, slide rolls came in all sorts of shapes. But he invented this simple form and the, the way the scales are arranged on it, which were much better than what they had before. And this is called the Soho slide rule. This is the one I bought at the bargain in Italy. So what is different between this and the first one you showed me? So that the, these, you still have one slide, right? But this has one slide. better has, organized or yeah. you have... This has the numbers on the bottom. Because I, I don't see it so well from here. Right? That's why I'm asking. I don't see exactly oh, okay. all the... Okay, uh, so we will post the, the address of my website and there's yeah. an article about it there with photos and close-ups about most of the things I'm showing here. Mm -hmm. We need to send people there. The idea here is he arranged the numbers on the bottom of the rule and the squares of the numbers on the top of the rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, he built it in this format. It is very convenient to use. For example, here's one that was before this model. Mm -hmm. This is a carpenter's rule. You can measure okay. inches but it has a slide, but this slide is this little metal piece that barely moves in this model. Okay. It's very inconvenient to use and see. This model was much more usable from a user experience point of view. And then we have the next development from a French officer called Amade Mannheim in 1851. This is this rule. Okay. So this also has the same slide going uh, in and out like the other one, but it has this piece. Okay. This is the cursor. And what it does is it allows you to see exactly which number on the top is parallel to the one on the bottom. 
So you can move between the scales mm -hmm. more easily. And after they had this, somebody came with the idea of making it of glass, like you see on this model, with so the hairline. Uh, it's definitely clearer to read. But this is also an innovation from 1891. This is a duplex rule. The other side also has a slide rule. Mm -hmm. And because the cursor goes around, you can move from scales from one side to the other. The one I showed you before doesn't have anything on the back. Yeah, so it's just one, one side. This one is two sided. And that brings us so to the So that means that if you position in the front, it, the back is connected as well at the same time, right? In, it's in so exponential the, or what's the, what's the connection? Well, let's say on the front you have the numbers and the squares, and on the back you have the cubes, okay. for example, or the yeah, sine, yeah. Or the tangent, so you can move back and forth. And that brings us to the slide rules of the golden age of these devices, which is like the 1950s. So here is a slide rule from the 50s. As you can see, it has on each side maybe 12 different scales, mm -hmm. all sorts of calculations. This is made of bamboo, and it's a, a wonderful device. I mean, with this, we put a man on the moon. So they had electronic computers during the Apollo program for, for some of the calculations, but mm -hmm. every engineer had one of these and they used them daily to do their work. Yeah. And when the astronauts went to the moon in Apollo 11, they took a slide rule such as this with them as a backup in case their electronic computer wouldn't work. Ah, but yes, of course. Everything you see, the Golden Gate Bridge, the, the Empire State Building, you know, the Titanic, all these were built with devices like this for computing. And the truth is it's a very convenient and rapid device for doing calculations to maybe three decimal places. Very nice. So and also is? it's a way to appreciate more as well, the ease. You know, now sometimes when I, uh, I need to do a simple calculation. Now there is, I don't know, the uh, Siri on the iPhone. You can ask, you know, what is the logarithmic scale of x, and you just get it, right? You just get the answer directly spoken to you. But but to get there, we we pass to so many interesting stages. And that's uh, that's fascinating. And also, I note I get work from students that I advise. I get the, the, their projects, and they have results sometimes to to eight decimal places. Yeah. for everyday yeah. things, which is ridiculous. Nobody needs to, that accuracy. It means nothing, but your calculator gives eight digits, so they do eight digits. Now, yeah. with a slide rule, you don't get eight digits, but you appreciate where the numbers sit on the continuum. Yeah, it's but a pity to approximate since you have the information, right? But you have to at one point. Right. So now I want to show you, uh, now that I've showed you the history of the, develop of the development of the slide rule, I'll point out one important thing about these devices. Mm -hmm. which is that you want them to have a long scale because the longer the scale, the more accuracy you can get, right? Obviously. Mm -hmm. So to that end, let me see where they put those down. What you do, how do you get a long scale without making the slide rule very, very long, right? So here's one thing you can do. You can make it circular, right? And have the scale going around. So obviously it's long, but it's wrapped around. So this, instead of being uh, straight, you just turn it and you will get the same outcome. Right. This oh, is yeah. a, and what, what is what, the thing in the middle that you were turning? In the middle, there's the CF, which is, uh, this is a Fowler calculator. I think his name was Charles Fowler. Yeah. But it's turning when you turn oh. the thing, right? So it's... Uh, oh, I turn this scale and I turn this hairline, but you probably don't see the hairline with this camera. Now we, I see the CF turning. Right, because it's connected to the hairline. Okay, okay, okay. In fact, this is the hairline here. Maybe. Okay, that, I, that, that, that's, yeah. And uh, so that's one way. Another way is to make it a spiral, like this device. This is the Otis King slide rule. This has a two meter scale on it. Mm -hmm. now it's not two meters long, but the scale, you can see that it's wrapped around and round and round very mm -hmm. tightly. And again, you can move it and, and do the calculations by adding the logarithm. And where do you read the, the results? Where is the, the point? Is there a point where you... You have the black piece. It has two pointers on it. You okay, two pointers. So you read and exactly. And the dot on this side has another pointer. Mm -hmm. And when you move the, all the pieces together, the pointer will show you the result. And then you have... What else have we got there? Well, we've got this beauty here. 
this is a very elegant uh, slide roll. This one has a, a 50 inch scale. The so it's, it's so open. small that you need a, a magnifier. A magnifier. And uh, if you look at it, you see the scale goes around and around in a spiral. Yeah. So that's, that's, another... that, that's also like a, almost a mainframe, right? <laughs> Considering uh -huh. the... Actually, this is one of the better quality precision slide rules out there. It's the Dempster rotor rule and was made by this guy, Dempster, in his basement, I mean, in, in his home. So it's a, an entrepreneur, a solo entrepreneur kind of person. Mm -hmm. And then you have this one that I'll show you and we'll stop with that on this part of the lecture. This okay. is a big one. This That's... is the fuller slide rule. And That's what not portable. Have, this is... Uh, yeah. It actually comes with a thing that you fix it to stand like this on your desk. Okay. But uh, you see it has a, a spiral scale also. This mm -hmm. one has a scale that's 13 meters long. So you can do calculations to four or five digits of precision. And again, everything moves in and out and around. And you have these brass pointers to, to point at the numbers and so on. And what is the, the biggest number you can get with that? Well, all these things go from one to 10, basically. Yeah. The question is how many decimals. Yeah, how many decimals? So four, four or five digits. This okay. one can give you four or five. Yeah. A regular slide rule can give you three, usually. You know, uh, something like this. So, what else? Next, I want to show you some unusual slide rules, and I start with this one. This is. Late so night. you have something unusual as well, like uh, big, uh, as considering that these were so usual, right? That everybody has them at home. Well, they, they're not that rare, actually. No, they're not rare, but but I, I I you know I I never even seen so many. I, I saw probably I remember just the the one that you were showing me initially, right? The the, the one that was used for the moon. Then I remember some. Uh, similar version, maybe less than that, but all the others, particularly the, the big conic shapes, yeah. I've never seen. So it's uh, very interesting. Well, so show me the unusual. This one is Chesterman's cattle gauge. And what it is, is it, it's, a, it's like a yo yo. No, it's like a, a measuring. Tape. A measurement, okay. Right? And you measure cows with it. Cows? Uh, yeah, after you measure your cow, like the height and the length or whatever they tell you to measure, there's instructions inside. So I took off the lid, and here is a little circular slide rule that allows you from the measurements to compute the weight of the cow in country stones and in London stones. So you can see this is old measurements. But it's quite convenient for measuring cows. Oh, yeah. So this guy, had a nice device. But uh, assuming that the cows had uh, all the same diet, or yes. what's the... What's look, the I'm no the... expert in cows. Okay. But the other way to do it is for the farmer to take a look and then say, okay, I think this cow weighs so much, you should pay me so much. And you say, I think it weighs less and you should pay me less. So this is at least gives you so one So that's number. approximation. So if uh, this part is this dimension, at least we can say that that should be the weight. Okay. Right, yeah. Interesting. So, what else have we got in the new? Oh, this is an unusual device too. This is a biomate, and mm -hmm. it is used. Let me see if we can get it. Do you see it well? Yeah. Uh, and no, maybe put it closer a bit. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Now I can see. It. So this device is for biorhythm. There is a, a bogus science of biorhythm, which uh, do you know what that is? Um, tell me the, more. AG thing where you say you look at where the at the date of your birth and then you have three rhythms which I forget if it's the emotional and the physical and so or whatever. Yeah. Then each day rhythms go and change and every day of your life you know is this a good day to do a new business or is this a good day? So something like astrology but uh, more now mm. the theory was there but this device but Gives you is it is it a proved? Uh, no, it's more of a theory, right? Hey, of course, it's bogus. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, but yeah, so what? Yeah. People believe in astrology, but the point is, you see the three scales that are rotating yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and the dates around the top. So for each date, once you set it to your moment of birth, every day of your life, you can see where your three cycles <laughs> are for that day. So that is a slide rule. So you, you, you can play the lottery in the best days and the other days and just lock yourself in the home. I don't want to mess with things. 
And Very lastly, okay, the usual ones here is an unusual. Big slide rule. This one is for black body radiation calculations. It was mm -hmm. built by the British Admiralty for, for the British Admiralty because I guess that is useful for their kind of research. But there is a lot of scales here about so both energies and, and all sorts of calculations involving radiation and the physics of, of radiation. But unfortunately, there's a lot of instructions on the back with all the formulas. So if you're into that sort of thing, you can know what it means. Yeah. But, um, I need to write it up for my website. Then when I do that, I have to research it and, and find what- The website that below here, you can get also the link. So you can get there and look at uh, several things, but uh, if you click on the history of computing, HOC, you get a lot of information about slide rules and calculators and yeah. I must say that's the fun part because buying something and putting it on a shelf is okay, but if I have to write it up, I have to research it. It forces me to, to understand it and I find interesting stuff. So all this slide rule business is coming to an end with this device on the 1st of July, 1972. Okay. This is your HP. That sounds like a calculator to me. This was the first scientific calculator and oh. they had it as an electronic slide rule because they wanted people to know what it does. But uh, <laughs> this device, I remember it cost $400 and I was a student in college and I had a, a friend in my class who was from America and, and had a lot of money and he had one of these mm -hmm. and all of us were green with envy. But when I got older and started collecting, I made sure to buy one so I would have one too. And how is it powered by what? What is the power source? Battery. I mean, a rechargeable battery. Ah, rechargeable battery. Okay. It, it works, actually. Nice calculator. I'm not saying HP were very good at making nice calculators, very mm -hmm. solid. But to that, on that one day, the entire industry of slide rules crashed. Nothing remained of it. Within two years, you know, they were gone. And probably now the in, entire industry of calculators is gone thanks to smartphones and smartphones, laptops, of course, right? that is life. And of course, you don't know what will happen to the smartphones. But oh, yes. Yeah. One day. Brain implants. I don't know. So, you want me to move on to other things? Yes, please. Okay, I'll just touch on mechanical calculators. Actually, mechanical calculators, many of them are big and I don't collect those. I have one or two, but you know, these are the desktop adding machines that you turn a crank and, and they calculate. Mm -hmm. I will show you two mechanical calculators. This one, this is the web adder, which is patented in 1885. Okay. And the output is here. Let me see if I have it right. Yeah. The output is right here in this little window. I don't know if you see the numbers, but there are two numbers there. And the input you do by rotating this. So I put in the stylus and the number I want to add until it stops. Okay. The telephone and it gets added. And I do it again and it gets added. But as uh -huh. you've seen, it carries to the next number, you know, to the next digit. Let me do it again. So you go around and I'll go around again, click, and this one moved one digit. Mm -hmm. Because that's what you need in a mechanical calculator is to carry the result when you go past past nine, or in this case, past 99. Mm -hmm. So this is a solid, hefty device. And I'm showing you the queen of all mechanical calculators, which is this one. This is the Kurta calculator. Oh this yeah, that's, that's, that's very low. I, I saw it uh, being built on uh, also with, you know, 3D printed and so on. That's uh, very interesting. That was a big one. This one was built by this guy when he was, uh, I mean, designed by this guy when he was in the Buchenwald concentration camp. And his captors decided that they want him to finish it so they can give it to Hitler as a gift on Victory Day. Mm -hmm. So they kept him alive. That's the advantage. And he did his designs. And when the war ended and Victory wasn't the way they envisioned it, so uh, he went in and started a company in Liechtenstein and he built these devices by the thousands. And they are a very nice calculator. You you dial in the numbers you want to add into these little thingies here. Mm -hmm. and see the numbers there. But uh, there are readouts. 
for where you have each number and then you rotate the crank. So each time you rotate it, it adds the number once and the result shows up in these little windows that you made yeah. on top. And then to clear it, you just take this little ring and you go around and it zeroes the readout. And then you can do it again. Very nice device. And it uh, sounds uh, very, very complex right? compared to the, the first uh, the first thing you were showing us, right? So when you talk about the this slide rule, a... like, okay, you just me measure the thing, but this is mechanical, understood, and a lot of things that needs to be moved in the right way. So it's quite interesting. This is 20th century. This is probably the top of classic mechanical calculation. Has mm -hmm. 600 parts in it, and it it moves like it, it's you know oiled and moved smoothly and very nice device. So that is what I will show you of mechanical calculations, and I will show you some electronics if you wish to see electronics. Mm -hmm. And what I start with the 1940s or so, 30s, 40s. First computers of that era. I think we need another box of this box. In goes this box. So the first big computers used relays. So this yeah. is a relay, it's a solenoid basically, it's a magnetically actuated switch. And when you take thousands and thousands of these, you can build a calculating device. Mm -hmm. The device that was built with these, this this is actually IBM. It has IBM imprinted yeah. on so your company. Really. And this is the ASCC or the Harvard Mark I computer used this type of, and this could have been a replacement mm -hmm. one. So these were time. like big rooms, right? With uh, yeah, a huge room uh, full yeah. of these devices and uh, it calculated. And it took a few uh, seconds to multiply two numbers, but it calculated. It was the first big computer, you know, the, the, where you have a computer center and this is mm -hmm. in it. And then come vacuum tubes. And here is another IBM device. This is a oh, yeah. pluggable oh, yeah. unit. So it has a plug at the bottom. And what they had is they had these calculators, which were you know, big uh, uh, cabinets. And in them, they had thousands of these. And the idea was they had maybe 10 different types of these. And when one burned out, they would just pull it out and put one in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically a very easy to, to service. And what they have in each of these is one vacuum tube, mm -hmm. which equivalent of one or two transistors that we have today. We made the vacuum because it's less subject to temperature and... No, no, it's vacuum because electrons move in the vacuum. The device itself, transistors... Ah, but move. they move it, okay, so it's not a protective thing, but this functional no. thing has to be part of it, yeah. Like a transistor or in a chip, the yeah, transistors yeah. work in silicon, the electrons and holes move in silicon. Yeah. This has electrons moving in vacuum between these metal pieces that you okay, see. Okay, okay, okay. So this is a pluggable unit. And by the way, I'll show you, they were very proud of it. Here it is. This is a, an ad from IBM for these pluggable units, if I can get it so you can see it. You see the guy standing next to the calculator at the yeah. bottom, and you see how the pluggable unit is piercing space. Yeah. Like they think it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> but that was a good marketing at the end it was if you have something that you can plug and unplug so to keep on going the calculation without afflicting the the whole process and the whole cycle that's cool you know who sold me this for for you know i know fifty dollars a hundred dollars this was a guy who had a scrap yard and years and years ago he got one of those computers to scrap and there were thousands of these units in so he kept the units and now he's selling them at, you know, $100 each. Mm -hmm. so very good business. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, nowadays, even things that were uh, super, you know, advanced when we were children now are pieces of, for, for a museum. So uh, well, if you have still something in your mother's, you know, closet or anywhere you just left something in a garage, now you have... Uh, something really valuable. Right? Let me even suggest, I once read in a newspaper about this guy that found in the attic a suitcase that his grandfather, uh, who was dead now, had kept for him a suitcase full of stuff from when he was young. 
And mm -hmm. like you say, very interesting and, and valuable and especially interesting stuff. And I said to myself, wow, too bad my grandfather didn't do that for me. And then I said to myself, what an idiot I am. Why am I not doing this for my grandchildren? Oh, yeah. So I started to do it. I mean, I am keeping stuff, interesting stuff from the progress of time that I lived through. So they're going to look at them saying like, what? Like prehistoric age. <laughs> right. So next I show you how these computers of those days were programmed. And they were programmed, first of all, using these, of course, right? Punched mm -hmm. IBM cards, right? Yeah, the punched cards. The blank card. And this is a punched card. You can see how it yeah. has holes. And the idea is each hole, as you can see, the numbers signifies one number. And their, their combination signifies digits or, or letters. And you can actually see this. This, so this is, is like a storage device, yes. Right. This is like the input device. It's input, yeah, it stores information, mostly. It's like now the first kind of so USB I, stick now, but at that, that time that was how you could use it, right? This is, you shouldn't uh, compare this to USB stick. You should compare it to your keyboard. This is okay. where how you fit okay. programs into the computer. So what I show you here... But didn't it, it, it but the, the, those kind of points are not uh, information? What? The, the the holes, it may mean yes. that they are bits, basically, right? Yeah. No, they are actually al alphanumeric characters. Yeah. Each column is in one character. You can see how at the top, the, the machine printed the actual characters. Yeah. So people could read it. And the idea is here, so here you have a few dozen cards. This might be a very small computer program. You put it in the computer in an input slot, and it reads each card. Yeah. Now, big jobs. Like my, my father was uh, using these when he was uh, a professor back earlier mm -hmm. in the 50s or 60s. So each job would be like one box, a big box, cardboard box full of these cards. Because each card is one line, is one command in the program. Yeah. So we do these. And also on smaller, like mini computers, we had when I was a student, we used these. So this is a paper tape. And again, each column is one number. In fact, yeah. the, this would be probably the ASCII code. I mean, a version of the ASCII code encoded into holes in a certain way. And you had a, a slot again that you So that, that is more like a software? You can use it for, for data or for software. Yeah. What you want. Right? Uh, in fact, software. if you think about the word to boot a computer, there was the bootstrap loader. When the computer yeah. you started the computer, powered it up, it didn't know anything. So you had to feed it. First, you had to toggle in on switches on the mm -hmm. mini computer, a very short program that would tell it to read the tape. The tape yeah. was the bootstrap loader that would tell it how to read the real program that you fed afterwards. Yeah. So this is about how you fed those computers. That's as we got here. Now I will show you. The next stage after the vacuum tubes, this is computers based on transistors. Oh, yeah. This is one of hundreds of cards that would go into a PDP-8 computer. And you just digital. pull the card and move the card. And yeah. Yeah. No. This is a printed circuit. This is part of the circuit. Yeah. And the black, the black round thingies are transistors. So this one has four transistors on it and all, some other stuff that might be the logic gate or, or, or flip-flop and some support circuitry. Yeah. And this is how they build computers with lots and lots of these, which we don't do that anymore, of course, because today we have microprocessors that were invented by my previous employer. And here I show you the first microprocessor ever. So this is the 4004 8-bit, I'm sorry, 4-bit microprocessor with uh, 2,300 transistors in it. Mm -hmm. This is the first time anyone put a processing unit on a chip. 2,300 inside that. And it's and nothing, it's actually 60, 000, big, right? 60,000 instructions per second. Would you believe mm -hmm. that? Four bit wide, right? So today you have billions and billions of transistors and then you work at gigahertz and so on. But that was the first. And then Intel went on, for instance, this is the chip of the IBM PC. Mm -hmm. The AT88. And this is the 
83, 86, I don't know if you remember that. Okay, that is a microprocessor as well, right? This is the microprocessor, you can see the silicon yeah. chip. I see, I see, yeah. Then there was, this one has its name on the back. Oh, Interpentium, okay, that was the 1992. Right, and this mm -hmm. is the Pentium Pro, which was a, a monster with two chips in it. It's a bad idea, actually. But they had it for a while, and then came all the others, and, and you know, today we have all these advanced processors. But you can see how they get bigger and bigger and bigger and get more and more transistors in them. But it, the number of transistors rises much faster than the size of the package. Yeah. So it moves a lot. Every two years, you can put twice the number of transistors onto a single chip. That's how it works. And that is why we have all that we have today. Our smartphones and everything would not be possible without this law and the ability of the engineers and companies to double the number of transistors every two years. Yeah, it but it's like a personal challenge as, as well, right? So that you, you have to, to do it anyway. Well, of course they have to do it. It's not a physical law. It's a, a management decision. This yeah, exactly. It's a management decision. You could do it four times a year or, or less, right? It just depends on, on how you take it. Well, what happens is the managers come, that's the way I see it, that they sit to the, in their manager's meeting and say, what shall we tell the engineers to do this year? And one of them says, you know what, last year they doubled the number of transistors. Let's tell them to do it again. And that's what happens because engineers, they do mm -hmm. what they're told. Mm -hmm. Tell them what you need and they do it. So those are the microprocessors. Here are some things you haven't seen and I will show them to you. This goes to, to how you store information inside of your computer. And I will show you this bizarre memory. This is a memory module from the USSR. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's so like it's probably seven one one byte or what, what it is. That's not the point. The point is the technology. You see, what oh. you have this wire that goes round and round. It's a nickel wire, okay. and at the two ends, it is held by little transducers that can give it a little twist. Now, when you take this wire and you give it a little twist, there is a wave of twist that goes along the wire as it propagates. You know, at a certain speed gets to the other end. Now you send it back. You twist mm -hmm. it again and it goes back. So the bit, which this is a bit of information, there was a twist, goes back and forth and back and forth. And you can inject maybe a few hundred bits by doing the timing right. Mm -hmm. So this is called a delay line memory, a magnetostrictive delay line memory, extremely pr primitive way of doing it. The Russians were doing it after you know, the West stopped doing it, but back mm -hmm. then, advanced technology you can see. Today you can get interesting collectibles out of the former Soviet Union because they're, they're throwing out things they don't need that are interesting to us. Hmm. And then I will show you another Soviet thing. Where did I put the Soviet thing? This is magnetic core memory. Okay. So, see the magnetic cores? The, the so these are the little, the little circles of the magnetic core, right? In the middle, yeah. There is yeah. The, 24 bits here. So these are Each magnets, is a bit. simple magnets. Well, it's a magnetic material and all the wires that are, let me try and stabilize it. The wires that go through them, magnetize them this way or that when you- Okay, so like plus or minus, right? Well, to the magnetic field going one way or the opposite way through the yeah. middle of the ring. So either now, goes in one direction and this what, how, how does it work then? Well, the, all the circuitry around it is to be able to send the right current through in order to either change the direction of the magnetism mm -hmm. or read it. Mm -hmm. So you can write and read. Okay. And this is extremely primitive in the sense that these are very big magnetic cores. In fact, I'll show you smaller magnetic cores. Like this one. This one. What I showed you now, I showed you 24 bits. This one is from a Univac computer and it has about a thousand bits. You can't even see the individual rings in there. But there are still magnetic cores inside, right? Yeah, there are tiny, tiny, tiny magnetic cores that you need a magnifier to even see. Mm -hmm. You can try that, I don't know if it will work. Let's see. No, I don't think uh, it would be very tough to do it. But I... Higher magnification. Oh, well, you can see it on my website. I have a... Okay. A, 
close up of this. I'm going to put a picture of it so all the folks can see it. Yeah. Okay, so that is my, oh, and last memory I'll show you is this. So at some point, Intel came on, on board and invented uh, this device, the 1103. This is the oh. first uh, DRAM chip ever, 1000 bits. And this is what Intel started about. I mean, this, is, this was their first uh, project. And so you have people buying those chips and building memory boards with it. So here is a 24K bit memory board mm -hmm. from uh, the 70s, probably. So, you know, when, when you're talking about the, the first uh, Apple computer or the mm -hmm. computer, they used boards like this. I found this in a garage sale in Silicon Valley in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So I threw it out. But the beauty of it is it has all these chips, which has probably 2,000 bit each. And look at the back side. Oh. Somebody sat there and wire wrapped every single pin of every single chip together. Completely handmade. This is what hobbyists do when they are fanatic. And what, what, like, because otherwise it wouldn't work, right? So that's actually where okay. you... You have to, to build it, right? You have to connect all the chips. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this yeah, connection, what kind of connection are these? Are just little wires? So let me see if there is some. Look, it looks plastic from here, right? Just. Uh, no, what you have, you see the sockets of the chips. So the chips yeah. are on the back. Yeah, the, the sockets, sockets are there, and then. Have pins. Ah, and the then pins, there's okay. a little gun that wraps the wire around the pin, and then you move to the other pin and wrap it around the other pin. Mm -hmm. It's a technique for wiring uh, prototypes. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this, and with this, I am getting closer to the end of all this. I will just show you uh, some storage devices. For instance, you know this device, right? Ah, that was <laughs> when I came to the picture in this world, I think. That right. was the normal. Oh, so you did, My you first games were on those, on those kind of memories. One point, what is 1.44, right? That was the... So you don't think that this is just a 3D printed uh, icon of the save icon? No, I think that's a normal floppy disk. Kind of. that's... Now you know this device, right? Yes, I know that. I But actually, when I started having computers, I had just the floppy. So this was uh, something I never effectively used or experienced. OK, so now I'm showing you. It's been that was, yeah. <laughs> This one is an eight inch floppy. It was yeah, great. I was there when they introduced them. It was superb. It cost only $10 each. The drive it's, only it's cost kind of a, uh, material is very cheap. It's not, uh, yeah. Right. The drive cost a few thousand dollars and everybody thought it was great. Super. You can really store stuff on this. So, yeah. so you see that this also evolves over time, getting smaller and smaller. But quite quickly, right? How, how it didn't take so long before the floppy was was introduced? Let me, first, well, floppies came around the time of the Commodore sixty four, so it's yeah. like late seventies. Pro. Well, the big floppies came in the seventies. The little floppies, I'd say, the, the no more than a decade, I'd say. And then the, the rigid ones, the three and a half inch, are Macintosh. Mm -hmm. So that would be mid 80s or something. Yeah. And then came these. This is a flash card, PCM CIA card without its cover. This, I think, had four megabytes on mm -hmm. it, one of the first Intel flash devices. And uh, this is, uh, of course, the precursor of today's uh, flash. Yeah, all the, the well, there, there was also the, the CD, right? At one point, it, we, we had mostly the, the CD and the DVDs and the mini discs. I was all too connected with the oh, yeah. optical. What you didn't see is they used to have, when I was a student, we had in the lab a record player for laser discs that were like this, but like vinyl, big vinyl discs. Mm -hmm. It was an early technology that didn't make it eventually, but you could record video on it, and they did. So with this, I'm done with the history of computing. We can talk a little about communication and information overload. No, but like how this is, you know, I, I think I, I, I made a bit of, I have a little idea, but tell me, how, how would you connect right, this uh, knowledge of the history of computing with the information overload. Is it any connection you make? 
let's put it one way, you know, let's say here, if they hadn't invented this device, right? Which is the original mm -hmm. Blackberry. Yeah. Have, we wouldn't have smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have information overload probably. With, without computing, there was no information overload. Back then, and I did prepare for you here two things. So this is, you know, a Morse key, right? I yeah. I used it as a radio amateur initially. A normal the telegraph, cool. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a telegraph key. So here is a telegraph. This yeah. one is actually Italian, right? Yeah. And uh, I guess my mother got it for, when she was in Italy for some reason back then. And you can see how it has somebody is wishing her a, a happy return. So probably it's her birthday. Mm -hmm. And the sender is a friend of hers. And you see this uh, paper strip that's glued on, the white strip comes out of, a, of the telegraph machine that prints on a tape as it, the tape rolls around. Yeah, and then you just put the tape on, yeah. Now, every letter counts. In fact, there is here, the number of words is, is noted because you pay by the word. Yeah. Which is why they say here, luck, health, happiness. They don't say good luck because that's one more word and it costs. So in those days, to send instant communication was expensive. It was complicated and you had to go to the telegraph office and so mm -hmm. on. You couldn't overload people with information in those days. Yeah, I, I was, I'm a fan of Sherlock Holmes, right? And I, all the time Sherlock is sending little messages through, uh, you know, young guys and so on that they're willing just to bring these little messages from one part to another of the city. I saw I any mean, telegraph just it goes through the wire, but it's still like a little piece of information, not so big, that has to travel and it needs to be processed and taken and paid. So it's a totally different feeling. If you're interested, there is a book called The Victorian Internet mm -hmm. that speaks about the introduction of telegraphy. It turns out there was a lot of telegraphy going on. There were networks of, of uh, pneumatic tubes under cities that would send capsules oh, yeah. with the compressed air with telegrams in them from one office to the other. And there was a lot of action in telegraphy, but it didn't get close to what we have today, of course, because you know you have to be a, a grown-up, serious person with a need to send. So to, to compare it to email, you would get no more than, I don't know, what couple of messages per day maximum, would you say? If you were a business, you would get more. But okay. if you were an individual, remember that Butler comes with a silver platter and, and shows the, the letter or the telegram to the master of the house in the movies. Yeah. So that is the way it was. And it cost money. If email mm -hmm. cost you one penny for each address, that would be the end of information overload. Oh yeah. Right? You send it only money. when you need it. Right. And uh, that, that's yeah. the way it works. But it doesn't cost anything. Everybody can send as much as they want. The quality is all over the place, of course. And we have a problem, and that's why we have IROC, so we can try and uh, oh, yeah. analyze and discuss and try to solve these problems. Because was, way, it, was it also who did the telegram to be a filter somehow? Like that it gave you a, an idea about how you should craft the message or, or not? Like you could just send whatever you wanted. If I wanted to send like blah, 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 I would just write type blah 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 and send it and how, how did it work willing, oh if you were willing to pay for it ah, okay for so it. the filter was mostly economical then and uh, mind you i was a radio amateur i didn't pay for communicating with people with mm -hmm. voice and with telegraph uh, i did it but there was a very high barrier to entry because i needed the government license to be a ham operator I needed to study a lot of, of uh, electronics and theory. I needed to achieve a certain speed with telegraphy, mm -hmm. you know, sending so many words on the telegraph key and per minute. And only then I got a license. So not too many people were willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of kept it to serious people. Of course, once we got the license, yeah, we talked about the weather and our equipment and blah, blah. But it was nobody was harmed at least because we chose to do it. Yeah. And every now and then we'd save a sinking ship or you no know, disaster zone, which they still do. Radio amateurs are still involved in disaster relief. 
Oh yeah, because that's the only thing that can get to everyone, right? But now they started also doing like uh, mobile networks, like the applications that are sustaining on themselves they, without needing the internet, but it's between between device and device, right? That's our options as well. But it's still like a radio idea to, you know, or like a walkie-talkie and things like this. Uh, so for RAM, radio amateurs is, they really know what they're doing in terms of the electronics of it they probably stay on longer than just your regular cell phone network that goes yeah. on and that you can't do anything. But now, now you know, yeah, your cast is one of the idea, yeah, even if you're video, but you, th there is a big uh, expansion into the podcast area nowadays. There are a lot of people that are podcasting and it's mostly audio. So audio is still uh, a need, something that is necessary. So, you know, the, the only difference is that the radio did, became digital in many ways. So you can, you know, have more channels and see here when you want. But I don't think it's something that is going to get away so soon. It's a very but useful it's fun. thing. Mind yeah. you, the, the whole thing is fun. It's fun to collect computer history. It's fun to collect anything, actually, if you're passionate about it. And it's great fun to communicate, whether by telegraph or by podcast or by webcast or by anything, as long as you do it because you love doing it and not because somebody's mm -hmm. paying you to do it or because you want to get advertising revenue from it. Mm -hmm. If you do it uh, seriously, it's very pleasant and, and you know, enlightening and interesting. And I love it. Yeah, that's you good. Love it. I hope you love it because you do so much of it. Oh, yeah, I do. I, I do. I do a lot. I... I, I like the fact that it's uh, you know an option to hear uh, people conversation to learn a lot and and I always always believe that you know the only way for humans to update our own software is through conversation that's our input system right and an output system so and that's the only way for it if we have enough open mind we can actually learn and keep you know changing our ideas right if you might believe one thing is true and then the only way for you to believe another one is just to have a conversation and just put all the things you have into a critic view to update yourself and radio is definitely something that and it's part of it you speak wisely but then you work at a company whose logo is think right so obviously you thought about this yeah but that not actually only only the uh, the, the thinking part, I think, is also um, it's the willingness to share, right, from from the other side. Right? So you can, um, you know, you know, have a lot of thoughts or be the smartest person in the world, right? But if you don't uh, share it, you don't share it with others, right? So we we can think about uh, even hard topics right something you, you you let's talk i don't know some very tough topic that could be you know the current uh, nationalities right there, there is nationalism outside right so you might have uh, somebody in your family that is a strong nationalist that believes that his own country is the best country in the world and you don't believe so right but because maybe he's your dad or is member of your family you don't get into this conversation because you assume that there is no point because everybody will end up on their, the position they were before. While that's actually the communication should be the opposite. To say that if you know that somebody else has another point of view, that's super exciting. You are able then to, you know, get perhaps an option to uh, learn something new yourself. Or, so every time you need to be ready for it and to reconsider. So, and talking about information overload, I think it's, um, uh, it's also something that, you know, Somebody might not notice that it's a truth and it's something that exists. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a conversation. I want to, to expand on this in another direction. Consider I was working in, in a cube farm like uh, where you are these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed that the company was not encouraging people to talk to people from other companies at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were discouraging it considerably. And uh, actually decided on information overload it was a good idea to talk to people in other companies that are working mm -hmm. on this problem uh, i had to to put up a fight for this because there were various uh, people who were concerned with the legal uh, you know implication that you talk to somebody and he sues you or whatever but the truth is i found that there are people in other companies that are very eager to talk 
mm -hmm. and it's changing. And I work to, to put in place the, the framework that would allow it to be legitimate and to do it. And in fact, one outcome of that again was IROG because uh, IROG came out of the collaboration originally between uh, us at Intel, so me and Microsoft Research mm -hmm. and University of Haifa. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was talking to Microsoft Research is because I put a lot of effort into being allowed to talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from that, we started talking to other people and, and their companies and things started moving. So I definitely encourage uh, anyone in the industry to, to try and get permission uh, or whatever the system is, wherever they work, to talk to people on the outside. You learn so much just from even visiting another person's office space and you see oh, that yeah. things are different. You don't but do also, I mean, we'll just learn with you eventually all those uh, amazing pieces of history you share with us are maybe crafted by one company, somebody earned on that, but the whole humanity leverage from the benefit of having that technology, right? So it, it is not only one one company business is every time is you can uh, you know the whole world think about the iphone and how it changed the uh, the environment and the more companies followed up and made even better phones right so most certainly here you show i'll show you this iphone you know what this is oh yeah that's uh, that uh, that was i don't remember the name it was the, the newton this is the newton, oh, newton, newton. okay yeah, yeah the yeah, granddaddy yeah. of all these devices from apple big failure in the market and then came the iPhone, right? So they did it right at the end. It wasn't it was the right writing. time for tablets, probably. You know, it had handwriting recognition and it could set up your meetings based on what you were writing on it. It was a great device in principle, mm -hmm. but uh, somehow it didn't catch and it was big. So, yeah, that's uh, a lot of ingenuity. That's another thing about the history of technology. These people, and many of them are really individuals working from home, and mm -hmm. they come up with great new ideas, which is cool. I, I think I, I still would like to talk about information overall for a second. So we discussed about the communication, we discussed about the history of various devices and how important it is to, um, to realize what we had in the past and how we didn't have overload before. Right, so that was probably a key to me, important to realize, you know, even if we had letters, we had telegram, telegrams and the telegraph before, uh, we couldn't get into an environment that was so uh, full of information. And even if I consider that there are definitely a lot of benefits on having everyone with the gift to share their own thoughts and the possibility and to get in touch, right? So I, I think um, I, I like the fact that it's free and everybody can get it and can do it and everybody can have his own radio and that, that, that's amazing. I still recognize that probably the problem is that as before the telegram, you had to pay for it. Now, since you don't have to pay, you don't uh, consider it as important as it should be because every single message every single thing we send could potentially spam, could create pollution, could create overload, and we should be really aware of the consequences. If we, we I'm thinking well. of another thing. Back then, so in the 19th century, if you were a person from a good family, mm -hmm. then you got educated in the liberal arts, right? Okay. Which included, in general, the idea was you would learn to write, and to speak in public and, and mm -hmm. to sense when you express yourself. Mm -hmm. that the art of how to write a good letter or a good essay was something that you studied. Today, even students in university, frankly, they rarely know how to read properly. I mean, how to critically read a piece of mm -hmm. research. And they rarely know how to write well I mean, in terms of the language. And we can blame it on, on the textiles language, you know, of, of instant messaging or on whatever but the fact is the art of communicating is more today about quantity than about quality maybe if people knew how to write a letter they would think twice what they put in an email and the email could be read twice as fast yeah i, I, I agree with that and that's all about i always call it mindful communication right that means really paying attention to what we write to what we say 
to with whom who we have in front of us um, yes. and that will really change a lot right so thank you so much nathan for for sharing your uh you know, you. wonderful you work and usually i show it to people who come to visit me but uh, this is the first time i'm showing it other than having the website but you know explaining it this way everybody can tune in if it interests them so the, the interesting thing is you can get to this link and look at um there is not only the picture of the devices that we just saw but also an interesting description with the dates with a lot of information that and uh, i think you keep updating it uh, when you have new uh, new objects and new interesting things so uh, if you have perhaps something that you don't need from your, you know, anywhere or your garage or from your grandmother and you would like to make a gift for the future of humanity, that would be something that you can send it to Nathan. Why not? Right. There is maybe always this opportunity. I, I think I, I would do that. I have, I think in the garage in my home, I have uh, my first computer with a uh, lot of floppy disk i have no idea what i i don't need them right i don't use them they're just there in the garage but this computer is still working right so you never know so uh, that th those are things that if somebody's collecting i would love this somebody to get it like you know that that, that seems something and, and um, from time to time somebody connects especially what i find fascinating sometimes the descendants of the inventors of the devices on my website yeah connect to me. And they give me information or they might give me something from their ancestor that they kept but most important for me is the information they, they tell me about who the person was that made the invention yeah. and how they might remember this person and what they were like and that is fascinating and then i put it on the website so everybody can benefit from that information cool so, so yeah. thank you for sharing and uh, thank you for for being here and dedicating your time to to share with all of us this is um, I think the end of our IRCast and uh, um, yeah. see you soon with the next one and uh, not forget to subscribe here and enjoy and comment and share whatever you think about it and where you would like us to go with the next one. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye.